Well, in our second session, we'll just call it Sunday. And uh, clearly, the Sabbath in the New Testament period is uh, 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 very conspicuous in many, many ways. We recognize in the New Testament period that the true meaning of the Sabbath had been obscured uh, by all, a multitude of these restrictions that were laid upon uh, on the people. And it had largely become external and formal. And uh, so it was inevitable that the Lord, Jesus, would come into conflict with the leadership over the Sabbath. We realize it was Jesus' custom to attend the synagogue on every Sabbath. And we find that in Luke 4, where he actually announces, he reads from Isaiah and, and announces his mandate. It's one of the most dramatic readings in the Scripture because he reads this passage from Isaiah and then says, this day is this scripture fulfilled. And basically he's announcing himself as the Messiah. And when you get it, I won't take the time in, our, in the interest of covering our other material to get in the details there, but if you re recognize in Luke 4 when he reads from Isaiah, the passage reading is from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. What you want to do is compare what he read compared to what's in Isaiah, and you'll discover he stopped at a comma. He didn't finish a sentence that's in Isaiah. He stopped at a comma, closed the book and said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in the earth. What he read, a verse and a half, was all the details of his first coming, his ministry, healing the sick and so forth. The part he did not read is very provocative. And the day of vengeance of our God. And that's what describes his second coming. He will fulfill that too, but it's it, that, that comma, as we would call it in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2, has lasted 2,000 years. But just as certain as he came the first time, He's going to return. And when he returns, he has a whole different agenda. Anyway, the fact that Jesus is in the synagogue, as you read the Gospels, all of them, they, all, they all make reference to that. But one of the things you should be sensitive to, that in his teaching, Jesus upheld the authority and the validity of the Old Testament law. And uh, let's just take a look at Matthew 5. Obviously, we could take many, many passages to emphasize that. I'm just, I'll just pick a few. But Matthew 5 is a conspicuous one. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the Torah, or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, not one, uh, one yacht or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now, a yacht or a tittle are he, uh, Hebrew terms. A yacht looks to you, you and I would mistake it for an apostrophe. It happens to be one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, but it's a yacht. It's, a, it's like a little apostrophe, little, it, almost like a little ink mark. A tittle is the little decorative hook on certain letters. So I don't, it, it, the way you would probably paraphrase this in the English is as if Jesus said, not, not the crossing of the T or the dotting of an I will pass till all be fulfilled. And by the way, I think this has much more implication than most people realize. I believe that Jesus took the Bible very, very literally. And uh, that enters into a whole other debate. Let's keep moving. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. I want you to picture the crowd. Who do you think was in the back row? These guys. They were not overjoyed with this teacher exp expressing this perspective. And we tend to knock the scribes and the Pharisees. Let me tell you, these were dedicated people. They took their calling seriously. Admittedly, they may have missed the point on a lot of things, but don't knock them. They tithed one day in seven. And uh, they gave themselves seriously to their attempt to keep the law rigorously. And uh, that was their whole... And to a Jew, that was the ultimate, to be a scribe or a Pharisee. I mean, these guys were the professional law keepers. And for Jesus tells them, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. What a blow to the Jew. Serious stuff here. Serious. So Jesus upheld the authority of the Old Testament law. There's lots of other places in Matthew 15 and 19 and 22. Uh, let's, take, let's take a look at Matthew 22. That, uh, I, won't, I won't try to take all of these or we'll be here beyond uh, a lot of time. 
This is a famous passage in, in, in Matthew 22, verse, starting about verse 35 to about verse 40. Uh, then one of them, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. There are many that will use this, and maybe not, in, not inappropriately, as the primary focus for all of our lives. The, re, the real enigma then comes in, in, in the implication of, both, of the two great commandments. Now, Jesus' emphasis, while he, he underscored the validity of the law, his emphasis was not on the external observance of the law, but on the spontaneous performance in pursuit of the will of God that underlay the law, that under, was underneath it. In Matthew 5 and 19, there's plenty of passages in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere that deals with that. And, uh, but perhaps the key verse to our subject tonight is in Mark 2.27. Jesus clarifies the true meaning of the Sabbath by showing the original purpose for its institution. What was in God's heart? What was God's desire here? Jesus says in, Matthew, in Mark 2.27, The Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. And that's his rebuttal to these rigorous rules and burdens that had trammeled the society. And, and in so doing, totally lost the concept of what the Sabbath was instituted for. Now, as you read the Gospels, you quickly discover it's almost as if Jesus went out of his way to antagonize these guys. Because he seemed to just look for things he could do on the Sabbath day to get them upset. I don't really believe he did that. I suspect he did it on many occasions. Uh, by the way, the assertion by some, that, uh, some of the people that like to, to emphasize this aspect of it, that Jesus only healed on the Sabbath day. That's not true. Well, there are some verses I'll show you where he healed on other days too. And I suspect he did it every day. The ones that he did on the Sabbath day are recorded because they led to a, to a confrontation that, was, that would be illuminating. You might turn to Matthew 12. Uh, in one of these famous confrontations. Matthew 12, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the grain fields, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck the ears of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, by the way, that was not stealing. That was part of the culture. You know, uh, a stranger could do that. There were circumstances in which that was appropriate. But anyway, the, the problem here is that it was a Sabbath day. If you were the grain, you know, the field owner, you weren't supposed to harvest on that day. And, uh, uh, but they're just walking, they're just hiking through, and they, 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 so they took some to eat. Verse 2, But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto them, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, and, and, that, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God. And did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them who were with him, but only for the priests. What he's referring to is the, uh, uh, the tabernacle. The temple hadn't been built yet. Psalm was yet coming. The tabernacle. In the tabernacle, as you, there was the outer court, one gate. As you enter that gate, you, there was this, this sort of portable building thing. And as you entered it, you, act, if you, you had a room that was like... Uh, uh, two cubes long. There's a fine, like if you visualize three cubes, uh, one room being two cubes long, the third one being the Holy of Holies. But as you enter this first holy place, as they called it, to the left was the menorah, the, the, the uh, uh, lampstands, sometimes called candlestick through an uncomfortable, unfortunate translation of the King James, but it's an uh, oil bearing lampstand, seven lights on it. And uh, to the right was the table of showbread, or table of its presence, sometimes called. And they had 12 loaves of bread there changed every Shabbat. One loaf for each of the twelve tribes is the, con is the symbolism there. And then always associated to the inside of the Holy of Holies, but technically outside, is the golden altar, the altar of incense. And a lot of confusion because it sounds like it's inside but it can't be tended then because no one can go in the Holy of Holies except the high priest and only once a year and only after great ceremonial preparation. So that's, the, that's where the priests did their thing. Now, it a non-priest wasn't even supposed to go in there, number one, and certainly not help themselves to the bread, you see. 
And Jesus is pointing out, David, that he was in flight for his life. He and his men. They needed provisions. So they went in there and grabbed it and went on. And Jesus points out, uh, have you not read that David did when he was hungry and they were with him, how he entered the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them who were with him, but only for priests. Jesus is making a distinction between ceremonial law and moral law. You see, doing what's needful, violating those rules because of the exigency of the flight for life, speaks for itself. You see, he goes on, he says, or have you not read, verse 5, in the law that uh, how on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that are in this place is one greater than the temple. That ought, if they were upset before, now they are upset. Okay? And he's going to make reference to this in his trial. Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up. That comes up in the trial. They misunderstood. They said he's going to destroy the temple in three days. No, he's speaking of the temple of his body. In the remark that he subsequently makes that gets quoted in his trial. But if he had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. There it is again. And so that was one of the first of these, or not first, but any one of these conflicts. It's also recorded in Mark 2 and Luke 6. But you see, the main point is Jesus here puts the Sabbath commandment in the category of ceremonial law. That's going to be, not going to be material to our doctrine we'll come to, but I just want to make that point. Human need has precedence over the ceremonial requirements. That's, the, I believe, the, the inference here. Now, in, in John 7, we have to look it up. Uh, Leviticus 12.3 uh, indicates that you can circumcise a male child on the Sabbath day, should it, should it be required to do that. In John 7, uh, Jesus makes uh, an allusion to that very issue. And, of course, Jesus asserted his lordship over the Sabbath. We just saw it here in M Matthew 12.8, also Mark 2.28, and, and Luke uh, 6.5. Now, you might turn with me to, uh, let's, well, right here, let's take, the, take this version that's right here, continuing here, starting at verse um, 9 in Matthew 12. When he was departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Behold, there was a man who had his hand paralyzed. And they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? That they might accuse him. See, they're ready for him now. He's going to do, it, you can do something like that. You can, you can break the law. Here's, you know, this is one of those things where you could argue, I imagine in their mind, you could do that tomorrow, you don't have to do it today. You know, I mean, why do it on a Sabbath day? Anyway, verse 11. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will, not, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath days. And then he said to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. He stretched forth, and it was restored well like the other. Now, I want you to notice how grateful and impressed the Pharisees were in verse 14. And the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. And, uh, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, and my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I'll put my spirit upon him, and he shall show justice to the Gentiles. And he shall not strive, nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. And bruised reed. it goes on quotes from Isaiah. And uh, there's another episode similar to this. Uh, there's a lot of these, but in fact there's uh, about uh, seven of them. But let's take Luke 13. Let's get our, find our way over to Luke 13. There's another episode that we might just take a look at starting about verse 10 and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath if it was the Sabbath you'd expect Jesus to be in the synagogue verse 11 and behold there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together hunched up in other words and could in no way lift herself up and when Jesus saw her he called her to him and said unto her woman thou art loosed from thine infirmity he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with an indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. I can't get over these guys. Um, they want to try? I don't know. Uh, anyway, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them. Therefore come and be healed, but and not on the Sabbath day. 
The Lord then answered and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loosed from his bond on the Sabbath day? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. It's strange on the reaction of people to these things. Uh, you remember La the raising of Lazarus? It wasn't it's not a Sabbath issue, but I'm always intrigued when Lazarus. Remember when Lazarus was, he was definitely dead? Everybody knew it, and he calls Lazarus forth and raises him. You know what the reaction of the Pharisees were? Yeah, they had a plot to kill him. They couldn't have him running around, and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, amazing. There are actually seven of these healings on the Sabbath day. Uh, the demoniac on, uh, in Capernaum in Mark 1, Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum in Mark 1, the impotent man in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, John 5, first nine verses, the man for the withered hand we just read, it was there in, Mar in Matthew 12, but also Mark 3. The woman bowed together is in Luke 13 as well as uh, Matthew here. The man with dropsy in Luke 14, and the man born and blind in John 9. In each of these instances... Jesus demonstrates that human need is placed above the cer external ceremonial observance of the Sabbath. And, uh, but you know, it's interesting. He never did or said anything to suggest that he intended to take away from man the privileges afforded by that day of rest. There's a difference between instructing them on how it should properly, you know, the, the, the license they had to do good rather than observe all these ceremonial uh, restraints on the one hand, but he doesn't, he doesn't obliterate the Sabbath day. He doesn't, there's no evidence in my mind that he, he uh, it takes away the privilege of the Sabbath day. Recognize it was made for man. He doesn't take it away. Now, the, the, the assertion is made by some who argue that he only healed on the Sabbath. Not true. In Mark chapter 1, verse 32, uh, he, was, he healed on a Sunday, the day after the Sabbath. Not making a big thing of it, except to notice that he didn't uh, const, you know, restrain himself to do it only on the Sabbath day. Well, let's shift from Jesus to Paul. Let's talk a little bit about Paul and the Sabbath. Let's realize that the early Christians in large measure were Jews. And, so they, and they were loyal Jews. They worshipped daily at the temple in Jerusalem. We find that in Acts 2 and Acts 5. They attended services in the synagogue in Acts 9, 13, 14, 17, uh, 18, and so on. They revered the law of Moses. In fact, to a fault. That leads to a whole but another issue. In fact... A big dispute emerges in the first, what, 20 years of the church history when Gentiles were being saved. Paul was arguing, you know, that, uh, and Paul and Peter both recognized that the, the gospel was reaching out to Gentiles. Now, the pattern prior to Jesus was that if you were a Gentile, you could proselyte into Judaism. You could become a converted Jew, so you could convert to Judaism. And if so, you could enter the, what's called the court of the Gentiles in the temple. If you're just a Gentile, you couldn't. But if you're a proselyte, you could. And so naturally, when Jesus came and the gospel was preached and so forth, the Jewish mind assumed that, gee, the way you become a Christian is to proselyte to Judaism and then accept Christ and you're a, a, you know, a Christian Jew. And both Paul and Peter point out that they did not, a Gentile did not have to put himself under Judaism to become a Christian. Big debate. So much so, they have this huge bruja which leads to what we call the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. And uh, we might turn to that because it's a very pivotal point about a lot of issues in, in Acts chapter 15. The big, the, there's actually two issues here, but most people don't recognize the second one. Verse 1, A certain man who came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Circumcision isn't the only issue. That's just idiomatic of the whole thing, the whole uh, 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 burden of being a Jew. And when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation among them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through a bunch of places. I'll cut through some of this. Anyway, they get together. At verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And uh, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, 
Ye know how a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's referring to Acts 10, the, the incident at Cornelius' home and all that. But verse 8 continuing, And God, who knoweth the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And he meaning Peter's talking about these Gentiles. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why put God to the test to put a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? And I love verse 11. Notice the ellipsis that Peter throws in here. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. He doesn't say, gee, they'll be saved just like we are. Look at us. He turns it around. He hopes that they'll, we'll be saved just like they were, these Gentiles. We had the Holy Spirit and all this. Yeah. Interesting rhetorical device there. I like that. Notice the contrast between Peter before in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Two different guys. In the Gospels, Peter is clumsy. The only time he opens his mouth is to change feet. He's always putting his foot. You know, he, he's, he, he's, he, he's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. In Acts, read his speech, not only in Acts 2, but in Acts 3. Eloquent, organized, articulate. You want to see evidence of the Holy Spirit, infill, in, infilling the Spirit. Just look at Peter's life. Very interesting. But anyway, uh, they, 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 uh, verse 12, the multitudes kept silence, listened to the Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God hath wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they held their peace, James, this is the Lord's brother, didn't, was not a believer before the resurrection, not only became a believer, but the head of the church in Jerusalem, answered and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. And then he quotes from Amos 9. Simeon that declared how God first did visit the nations and take out a people for his name. And to this agree, the words of the prophets is written. Oh, here's where he quotes yeah, Amos 9. After this I will return. See, first a people is called out. See, Simeon has declared how God first did visit the nations to take a people out of the name. Then after this, he says in Amos, God says, I will return and we'll, be, uh, we'll build again the tent or the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and we'll build again its ruins, and we'll set it up. And the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the nations upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, that doeth these things. Known unto God are all his works in the beginning of the age. So here's what he says. James says, Wherefore my judgment is that we trouble not them who are among the Gentiles who uh, return to God. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and, and from things strangled and from blood. And Moses' old time hath, and he goes on, he, he makes his case. When you get, they, they agree to write letters in verse 23, and, and you'll notice that in verse 24, here are the terms. For as much as we have heard that certain who went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled in one accord, to send chosen men unto you, and so forth. You get down here to um, verse 27. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who also tell... This is being promoted to all the churches from Jerusalem. Um, the same things by mouth. Verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay up on you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from things offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. From which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare thee well. You notice what's not mentioned there? No circumcision, no Sabbath day, no lots of other things. Just those essentials. Interesting. Key part of it. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, is clear, as you read the writings of Paul, and we could spend a good bit of time on this one, Paul regarded the yoke of the law a bondage from which the Christian was set free. And clearly, probably the principle, uh, it's in many of his epistles, but especially the book of Galatians. The whole book of Galatians is a, a call out of religious externalism of whatever kind. Not just the Jewish, although that's part of the issue, the one we're talking about here, but any form of legalism. Yeah, that's what Paul tries to get through with, with uh, Galatians. And certainly the book of Romans. You can't go through the book of Romans competently and not realize that the whole theme is our liberty in Christ, that Christ fulfilled the law for us. Now, there's our ways is to abuse that liberty. That's a whole other issue, but we are not under the law. Major, major emphasis. It's interesting, Paul made no distinction between moral and ceremonial law. He lumped them all together. They were all part of that old covenant which was done away in Christ, 2 Corinthians 3, 14, other passages. Colossians 2, 14, it was nailed to the cross. 
People who do not understand the dangers or the threat of legalism don't understand what happened at the cross. That's the key to the whole thing. And it's the simplest thing and yet the most difficult thing to get across our liberty in Christ, that Christ did the whole job. We can't add to it. To try to add to it is blasphemy. That's the real issue that lurks under the Saturday-Sunday dispute. Is not Saturday or Sunday. We'll come to that. But uh, the real issue is, are we under the law or not? Once you, once you put it in those terms, then the Scripture is clear. It's interesting, Paul also talks about the Sabbath among the festivals and new moons, all of which are a shadow of things. Turn to Colossians 2.16 and 17. And this is the one you may want to mark and memorize. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Very key verses. Paul is laying it right out for us. This is, one, this is a key verse you want to mark. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of a feast day or of a new moon or of a what? A Sabbath day, which are but a shadow of things to come but the bodies of Christ. This is a climax of a whole tour de force that starts way back in verse 9, how the believer is complete in Christ. I won't go back to verse 9, but let's pick it, pick it up, what Christ has done. Oh, let's start about um, verse 12, I guess. It's hard where to start. You can, the whole thing is a flow here. Uh, speaking of how you and I are buried with Him in baptism, in which also ye are risen with Him through faith in the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And what did He do with them? Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, those are ranks of angels, the dark side. Uh, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in food or in drink or in respect of any feast day or of the new moon or of a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come for the bodies of Christ. One of the most interesting studies you should undertake if you haven't done so yet is to study the feasts of Israel. The feasts of Israel. There are seven Mosaic feasts. They are, each one are historically embedded. They, they, rise, they rise from Israel's history. But each one is also prophetic in some amazing ways. And I don't have the time to even give a quick summary here. There are seven of them, three in the first month, three in the seventh month, and one in between. The first three are prophetic of His first coming. The last three in the seventh month are prophetic of His second coming. The one in between is a really weird of all of them, and it speaks of the church. It speaks of leavened bread straight. You only feast in the Torah with leavened bread. Interesting study. Every detail of them is prophetic, and I encourage you to get a, a competent guide and go through that. We do have a briefing pack called Feasts of Israel, which will take you through them if you're so inclined. But what is really, this is, it's a springboard from verse 17. All these things, the Sabbaths, the, the Jewish calendar, they say the, Jew, the Jews' catechism is his calendar. If you really understand the Jewish calendar, there's more prophetic relevance to that calendar. And one of these is the Sabbath and the uh, Sabbath rest. We'll come to that in a minute. But the first point here is if you observe the days and the months and the seasons and the years, you are slaves to weak spirits. Galatians 4, verse 9 and 10 deals with this. Colossians 2.20 deals with this. The observance of days is characteristic of someone who is weak in the faith. Now that may sound strange to you. Some of you are still fresh from our Roman study. But let's go ahead anyway and turn to Romans 14. And let's just read... First, oh, let's read the first five verses together. Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. It's a vegetarian. I want you to notice something. Who's the stronger and who's the weaker? There are some people that have chosen to observe restrictions. There are others that ignore the restrictions. 
Which one's stronger in faith? By Paul here. He's arguing to the, the, the church, the, the, the believers in Rome. He that is weak in the faith, receive him. But not too doubtful, not, not, for, not to argue with. Doubtful distributions. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another eateth herbs. Some, some believe he can eat anything, some people are vegetarians. Now he's assuming the vegetarian thing here is a religious thing. You can, you can be a vegetarian because you happen to, there, there, there are good reasons you may want to be a vegetarian that have nothing to do with your belief structure in terms of the scripture. Don't misunderstand me. But here he's talking in that context. Who's the weaker? The one that eats everything or the one that denies himself some things? Who's the weaker one? The one that's denying and putting himself under some restrictions. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be held up, for God is able to make him stand. Now here's verse 5, the key verse you may want to mark it. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Does that sound like Paul is enfor enforcing the Sabbath on Gentiles? I don't think so. He's making just the opposite point. Let's go to verse 6. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Then he goes on to make his whole case, and, and that's the uh, whole flavor of 14 and 15, Book of Romans. Now, there is a view, and you can defend the view, that to a Christian, he, every, every day is holy. And that's a, that's a great line. It should be. Every day is holy. On the one hand. On the other hand, the concept of the Sabbath was a day where you set aside your own interests, and you really focus on the Lord's. You can't do that every day. It's called renting groceries and stuff, you know, okay? But the idea is one, one day in seven, you really focus and on Him. That's the, that was the concept. But the first point is there's no grounds for imposing the Sabbath on the Christian who is free from the burden of the law's demands. In the Colossians passage, he says that he's taken the handwritings of the ordinances that were against us and nailed it to the cross. Another way of translating that, I think in New American Standard, one of the other says the same thing, the certificate of debt. And that becomes a little clearer. And uh, there is a procedure in their culture you need to understand. That when you were, if you were um, convicted of a crime by a court, you owed society a debt. And they literally drew up a certificate of debt. And you were put in prison. And uh, that record was kept with the jailer. And let's assume you'd been sentenced, say, to five years. Just pick a rhetorical device. Because that for five years. As you, as you ticked off your years, that would be recorded on your certificate of debt. When you finished your five years, they would write across your certificate of debt, paid in full, and hand it to you when you were freed. And you kept that as a valuable paper because that was your protection against je double jeopardy. You could never be tried for that crime again. You'd paid your debt to society. That's where we get those idioms. It's from that ancient Greco-Roman culture. Now, there's another side to this. Let's assume that you'd served two of your years of your five and you escaped. Who do you think gets hooked for the three missing years. The jailer. And that's why the Roman soldiers were going to kill all the passengers in Acts 27 that were on that shipwreck before they hit the land. The centurion wouldn't let them, of course. Um, that's why the Philippian jailer, when he heard the things were all empty, he was going to kill himself. And Paul said, no, we're all still, we're still here singing hymns and stuff. It freaked him out. He, came, he, he changed his eternal destiny over that whole issue. When Jesus hung on the cross... One of his last words were, to tell us die, is where it's recorded in the, in the Greek, which is translated in John 19, it is finished. One Greek word, to tell us die. It's legitimately translated, it is finished. It's just as legitimately translated, paid in full. That's what they wrote across your certificate of debt, to tell us die, paid in full, hand it to you. Your debt and mine is paid in full at that cross, back then, still. Even when you screw up next week, paid in full. So you have liberty in Christ. Not a liberty, not, not a liberty to abuse, but you are freed from the law. Why? Because it was nailed to the cross with him. That's the whole point of the book of Romans. If that's wrong, throw away all Paul's epistles. All of them. 
because they all deal with that in one way or another. Now, um, he says these things are a shadow of things to come. You caught that phrase in Colossians, right? 117. How is the Sabbath a shadow of things to come? That's recorded in the first 11 verses of the book of Hebrews, naturally. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, first 11 verses. This is the shadow of things to come from the Sabbath. I'm getting ahead of this to make sure we cover this. Then I'll cover some other things. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. I believe the book of Hebrews is written by Paul. That's not material to this argument. So I'll mention it in passing so you at least know where I'm coming from. But uh, Hebrews 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, quote, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest on the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, he says, If they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day, saying, David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day, there remaineth a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, there's much more here than we can deal with. We really need to get into the whole context of the, the epistle of, uh, of, of the Hebrews. But the point is, the Sabbath is also a type, a spiritual foreshadowing of a rest. And not a one day and seven issue, but a permanent rest in Christ. Not the whole story, but a key part of the story is you enter into that rest when you finally realize that your works, anything you might do, is valueless. The only thing that has merit is that which the Holy Spirit does through you. That's a hard idea to get across. Paul works hard at that in most of his epistles. It's climaxed here in Hebrews for a number of reasons. But once you trust Christ that much, then you can enter into that rest because it's not your effort, it's His that accomplishes your benefit. And that's really a quick, clumsy summary of that rest that Hebrews here is talking about, of which the Sabbath is a foreshadowing prophetically, typologically. So, but let's, okay, we've talked about the Sabbath again. Let's get back to the, the uh, first, you know, the Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. How did Sunday, the first day of the week, become a Sabbath? Has God authorized this change? And if so, where? When? When do you do this? There's obviously a distinction between the seventh day itself and the institution of the Sabbath. And uh, the question of which day doesn't really uh, affect this, the, uh, the perpetual obligation of the Sabbath as an institution. Change of the day or no change, one way or the other, Sabbath remains a sacred institution. It can't be abrogated. However, you're going to play around with it. People say, well, gee, we're not sure which is Saturday and Sunday. I won't buy that, but that's, neither, that, that's not the issue. The real issue is the, is the Sabbath. And if any change was made, it's my view that it ha would have to be made by Christ. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And part of my problem is I can't find any rec record where he explicitly does that. He, he's the only one that has a right to make that change, it's obvious. Now, as the Creator, he was the Lord of the Sabbath. He, he was the one that instituted it in the first place. John 1.3 and Hebrews 1.10 and elsewhere. It was originally a memorial of the creation, and that hasn't changed. Still the creation, he's, it's still a memorial of the Creator. Now, the argument is advanced with some validity that there's even a greater event than the creation that's been accomplished, and that's the redemption. Your redemption in mind is a far greater achievement by God than the creation. Well, that's a wild statement. How do I justify that view? It doesn't mean I'm right, but how, do I, how would I justify that view? Well, a couple of ways. One way I determine how important something is is how much space in the Word of God is devoted to it. Well, let's take the Creator. Let's take the creation. That's pretty neat. You got a couple of chapters in Genesis, right? You got a few Psalms, a couple of key chapters, a couple of chapters in Job, a couple of chapters in uh, Isaiah, and that's about it. Put some verses here and there. 
That's the creation. The other, well, let's talk about the redemption. The whole book of Genesis sets the stage for the redemption. That's what the book of Exodus is really getting into, the Passover lamb and all that stuff. And Leviticus, that's all the details. And Deuteronomy, <laughs> Numbers, the historical history of Israel, climax. You've got the Psalms, you've got um, <laughs> the prophets, major, minor, whatever. Redemption, God's climax. Look at the Gospels. What are the Gospels all about? Our Redeemer. Paul's epistles. And of course, the climax is the, the, is the book of Acts 2, namely Revelation. <laughs> Most of the Bible is on the redemption. There's another way to measure importance, and that's to look at the price tag. What did the creation cost God? He breathed it out of his nostrils. It took him six days. And some people, you know, if you want to argue that one, why did it take him so long? You know, I mean. Let's we'll talk about the redemption. What did it cost him? cost him his son. He actually had to go to death. He allowed man to get the predicament that nothing less than the death of God would extricate him. We have no ability to grasp what that means. We have a breathing back called the agony of love. How do you compress eternity into six hours on the cross? And you can't do it. There's a, there's a whole issue there you can study. So the redemption, uh, some would argue with some validity that the, the Sabbath memorializes the creation and some would argue that the Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the validation of God's whole program by the demonstration of victory over death itself. One can build that case, and I think competently. Would the calendar change? Well, the Jewish calendar changed at Passover. In Exodus 12, where all the rules are given out to Passover, which is on the 14th of Nisan, God says in verse 2 of Exodus 12, you shall make this month the beginning of months. In other words, you can change your calendar so Nisan is the first of the year. The Jewish calendar has their new year, Rosh Hashanah, in the fall, September, October, in our calendar. The Nisan is, we're coming into, you know, towards Easter, it's, it's uh, in the spring. The Jews have two calendars, a formal civil calendar, which is the one that was the Genesis calendar, i.e. starts in the fall, and they have the religious calendar, which starts in, at the month of Nisan because that's the Passover month. And on it goes. So, yes, the, the whole calendar was changed when, at the birth of the nation. So one could argue that our calendar has changed at the birth of the church. You see? Uh, you know, when? On Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So that's an argument. Now, I don't have any problem with that, except I can't find an explicit written thing in the text. So that makes me a little uncomfortable. I can defend it. I can sell it. But I'm privately a little nervous because I, I don't see a good, crisp place to hang that. Except it is, it is I think, consistent with the spirit of the text in, in, in a broader sense. Well, let's talk about the apostolic. It's always been said that, uh, you know, obviously we celebrate Sunday because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. By the way, I'm not sure he did. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, I believe that he rose after sundown Saturday. They found the empty tomb Sunday morning. So if you really want to quibble, I could wrestle you with on that one, but that's not the issue anyway. Okay. Jesus does appear to his disciples on four occasions. Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1, John 21, 20, verse 1. On Sunday, son, uh, he makes four different appearances. Some, they, they argue that he only appeared to them after his resurrection on Sunday. Not true. In John 20, verse 26, he appeared to them and then appeared eight days later. So one of those wasn't a, Shabbat, a, Shabbat, well, a Sunday, okay? So uh, the, the assertion by the arg argumentatively that he only appears on, on Sunday is, is an inference that doesn't follow the text strictly. So I wouldn't build doctrine on that. There, there's some that try to say that he also, his ascension occurred on a Sunday. Well, that was 40 days from the Emmaus Road experience, from, from, the, from the resurrection Sunday, and I don't think 40 is divisible by 7 precisely. So I won't quill, quibble, but I think trying to make it out, making the ascension, that number one, they, they haven't convinced me they can make that work that way, but even if they did, it doesn't prove a doctrine, but let's move on. Now, they, the disciples did meet on Sundays. They met on Sunday night in Acts 20, verse 7. They always loved to point to 1 Corinthians 16, 1, where Paul says, to, uh, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay by him as in store. Read the next verse, so that you won't take up the collection when I'm with you. 
So I'm not saying that, that, you know, that they didn't meet on Sunday, but it's not clear that that's a pattern you can build doctrine on. And uh, so these are thin arguments in my mind. So, so clearly they did meet on Shabbat, but they also seem to meet on Sundays frequently, so there was a pattern. Let's talk about the early church. That's a, the, apostolic, the point is the apostolic practice is not clear enough, in my opinion, to try to build doctrine on. It's interesting, but not inclusive. It's inferential. The early church, Ignatius, disciple of the Apostle John, Bishop of Antioch, wrote in the early years of the second century, quote, Be not deceived with strange doctrines nor with old fables, for if we still live according to Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. And then he goes on to categorize his readers as, quote, those who were brought up in the ancient order of things, close quote, but who, quote, have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath. So Ignatius doesn't argue it's not to observe the Sabbath. Justin Martyr, first great uh, Christian apologist in the middle of the second century, explains in his dialogue with Trifo why the Christians do not keep the law of Moses or submit to circumcision or observe the Sabbath. He asserts as follows. One, the true Sabbath observance under the new covenant is the keeping of a perpetual Sabbath which consists of turning from sin. Don't know where he gets that, but let's move on. Uh, two, the righteous men of old, Adam, Abel, Enoch, Noah, and the like, pleased God without keeping the Sabbath. I challenge him to prove that. You can't. I think they probably did for reasons I've already explained. Three, that God imposed the Sabbath upon Israelites because of unrighteousness and hardness of heart. Not true. He ordained that in Eden. So we're beginning to see even Justin Martyr in the second century what I would regard as a prejudicial statement rather than a proof. I'll come back to why I make that point in a minute. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, uh, in the latter part of the second century, viewed the Sabbath as symbolical of the future kingdom of God, which has some validity, in which the man who shall be persevered in serving God shall in the state of rest partake of God's table. He cites Abram as one who believed in God well, without circumcision, without observance of Sabbaths. They're assuming he didn't. There's no proof of that. I think, I think quite the contrary. I think he did observe the Sabbaths. Clement of Ale- but there's no textual proof of that. Clement of Alexandria, writing in the Stromata, to close the second century, says, uh, the Sabbath by absence from evil seems to indicate self-restraint. That's as far as he went. Tertullian, at the beginning of the third century, says, we have nothing to do with Sabbaths or other Jewish festivals, much less with those of the heathen. In another work, he says that those who would contend for the continued obligation of Sabbath-keeping and circumcision must show that Adam and Abel, Noah, Enoch, Melchizedek, and Lot also observed these things. I don't know why. He goes on to say that the Sabbath was a figure of rest from sin, and typical of man's final rest in God. That has some validity. It, together with the other ceremonial regulations of the law, was the only intended to last until a new lawgiver would arise who should introduce the realities of those things, of these which were but shadows. And uh, so on it goes. Now, obviously, the Sabbath continues among Christian Jews to the present time. And during the first centuries, the, some Jewish Christians also continued the practice of the seventh day of the week, as well as assembly on the first day of the week. But, there, but now, let me, having said all that, I want to be honest, I quoted from the, those are the primary authorities you'll hear thrown at you about pr- defending the idea that Sunday's okay. I have a problem building any doctrine from the early church. Why do I do that? Because I discover that other than the book of Acts, which is, I believe, rely, obviously reliable, uh, we discover in as early as the uh, late part of the first century that the churches were all screwed up. Because Jesus writes them seven epistles in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And what's interesting about that, in each epistle is a report card for each of the seven churches. Each report card is received by surprise. The guys that thought they were doing great were doing terribly. Two of them had no good things said about them. The ones that were actually thought they were doing terribly were doing great. Two of them had nothing evil said of them. Most of them had some good, some bad. There was a report card. The point I'm making, though, is each one was surprised. So I don't think the church fathers are some kind of authority on doctrine in the sense we're speaking here. And I'll give you some examples. They made some major eschatological errors. The early church had a stream of amillennialism. Origin... Uh, Allegorized his his, uh, epist- his exegesis was allegorical. He had no trouble making things symbolic. Augustine picked that up, and this is in the context of rising anti-Semitism in the early church, an anti-Jewish attitude. That's where you get these blood libels. All these have their roots back there, where the Jews killed our Messiah, Jews the Christ killers. All that nonsense had its roots way way back there. I would build my doctrine and practice on the scripture, not some writings of Tertullian or whoever. 
They're interesting, worth studying, don't misunderstand me, but I wouldn't build my, my faith on them because I, I find all kinds of things that the early church embraced that I know from the Scripture is incorrect. And so I, I share that with a, a you know, skeptical view. So there's a, now let's talk about the so-called Christian Sabbath view. This, this view holds that the Sunday is the Christian Sabbath, observance of which is a moral obligation based on the fourth commandment of the, uh, of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This view emphasizes the divine institution of the Sabbath as the, at the close of creation, um, that uh, God's blessing and sanctification of the seventh day is taken to mean that he intended one day in seven. That's basically the view. To be observed by all men in all ages as a sacred day of rest and worship. And uh, it's regarded as, as a moral com uh, command of the universal and perpetual obligation is held that Jesus affirmed that he was Lord even of the Sabbath. Indeed he was. And therefore he had the authority to change the day of his observance. It is usually held that this change took place during the 40 days between Christ's resurrection and his ascension when he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. That's an inference. There's no explicit... <coughs> The Sabbatarians insist that Jesus intended to perpetuate the Sabbath and extends application to all men. Much stress is, of course, put on the statement that the Sabbath is made for man, not man, not man for the Sabbath, as evidence that he regarded the Sabbath as an institution which was grounded in the very constitution of man, which was instituted by God at the very beginning, not only for Israel, but for the whole human race. I think that's correct. That part of it is. The teachings of God, Paul regarding the Sabbath are taken to refer to only the Jewish Sabbath and not to the Christian Sabbath. So they, have their, they want their cake and have it too, so to speak. Same thing. The Bible does teach that God instituted the Sabbath at the close of creation. That was in general. We saw that. The Sabbath is identified as the seventh day. You can't really escape that, honestly. And not as one day in seven. You've got a lot of scriptures that uh, defeat that. And there's both a moral and a ceremonial element in the fourth commandment. The moral element provides for the worship of God. Ceremonial elements only apply to the Israelites, is the argument. Jesus himself treated the ceremonial, uh, the law as ceremonial when he defended the disciples. We went through all that. The basic weakness of this theory is the teaching that a change was made in the day of the week to be observed as the Sabbath. You can't find any evidence of that. There's not the slightest hint in the New Testament that Jesus transferred the Sabbath to another day of the week. If one insists upon the perpetual and universal obligation of the fourth commandment, and at the same time recognize that there's no New Testament ground for a change in the day of its observance, the only logical position to which one is forced is to maintain that the seventh day of the week, and not the first day, should be observed as Sabbath, as the fourth commandment stipulates. And this is the position taken by the Seventh-day Sabbatarians and there are several versions of those. And uh, Sabbatarianism is the doctrine of Christians who believe that Sunday is the Christian Sabbath to be observed in, in the context of the, uh, the Fourth Commandment. Now, in its strictest form, it was the creation of the Scottish and English reformers, especially John Knox. The Scottish Presbyterians and the Puritans brought their views to the colonies where their rigorous blue laws were enforced. Christians who believe that the Sabbath should still be observed on Saturday are sometimes called Sabbatarians. Now, the Seventh-day Sabbath view, that's a different variation. So you're going to discover I don't hold either one of these. This view is held by the Seventh-day Baptists, who originated in England in the 17th century, and the Seventh-day Adventists, who originated in America in the 19th century. They insist that the Christians are obligated to keep the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. They regard the Ten Commandments as the law of God, as distinguished from the ceremonial laws, called, which they call the law of Moses. They find evidence for the observance of the seventh day in the New Testament. They appeal to the practice of Jesus' and apostles as attending the synagogue on the Sabbath. Lots of verses, but of course they were Jewish. They would. They apply Jesus' prophecy regarding the future flight from Jerusalem and his exhortation that they should pray that their flight should not be on the Sabbath day. Matthew 24, 20, it speaks of pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. If they fail to understand that that's yet future, and it's of them who are in Judea. So naturally, that's the Sabbath day is a burden to them. Certainly not to Christians. If we have to flee, we'll flee on Sunday whenever we get a passport or whatever, right? Okay. So uh, th this is a place where they're building doctrine from a faulty eschatology, or at least not allowing for the possibilities. In other words, that event is post-rapture. It's a whole other issue. They contend, by the way, that the, the passage in Revelation 1, verse 10, remember where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. They take for granted that the Lord's Day is referring to Sunday because they call Sunday the Lord's Day, don't we all? Uh, and uh, they feel that that's a reference to, a, uh, to the Seventh-day sa Sabbath. If you're going to argue that, it's really an argument for the Sunday Sabbath if you want to play that game. But the truth of the matter is, I don't believe either one of those is what John's talking about. I believe he's talking about, I was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. Not the Lord's day. As it, there's a difference in, in the rhetorical devices we would translate in English. I believe he's talking about the day of the Lord in the sense of Joel. By the Spirit, he's transported to the day of the Lord and all that that implies. It's not a 24-hour day. It's a period that Joel and all the prophets have a lot to say about. That's what Revelation 6 through 19 is a detailing of. Anyway. So anyway, actual evidence of a Sunday worship is circumstantially argued. That's probably true. 
the uh, uh, distinction is advanced by the Seventh-day Sabbatarians have no direct bib biblical evidence, unfortunately. That's why there's so much debate. And uh, now, as, as for comp now, the real problem here is the idea of compulsory commitments, because Paul definitely included the Sabbath command in those ordinances which were done away with with Christ. No question of that. And the, the evidence from the early church leaders that did not really uh, regard Sunday as a continuation, the, you know, these arguments even from the early church, nowhere do they treat Sunday as replacing the Sabbath. There's a difference in concept there. And so uh, later on, I just came to think of Sunday's bearing an analogy to Hebrew Sabbath, and others called the Christian Holy Day a Sabbath. They grounded the observance more in the authority, uh, authority of the church around the fourth commandment. Let's talk a little about legislation. You can't talk about Sunday without talking about our friend Constantine. Constantine was uh, battling his enemies uh, with his competitors to establish himself on the throne. And on October 27th in 312 A.D., on the eve of the Battle of the Milvane Bridge outside Rome, he is reported as having seen in this, a vision in the sky, uh, a, a vision of the cross with the words, In this sign, conquer. And uh, so he painted on his men's shields a figure that perhaps was intended to be Christ's monogram. Although some scholars think he may have had Christ confused with the Son in his manifestation of Summa Divinitas, the highest divinity. He won the battle in any case, declared himself a Christian, establishing the turning point in the history of Christianity. And that's, that, that's a matter of history. Whether this was a true conversion or, or just a politically advantageous rationalization is a matter of a lot of scholastic dispute. Like his father, he had originally been a votary of the Sun God and had gone to worship at the Grand Temple of the Sun in the Rosagas Mountains in Gaul where he had his first vision, a pagan one, by the way. Many people don't report on that part of it. This may all well have been simply a pragmatic attempt to unify the empire. You need to understand the problem this guy had. He's not ruler, he won this battle, so he's ruler of the world. What's he facing? He was faced with an empire following all kinds of pagan sun worship, several different kinds. The Syrian solar cults of Sol Invictus, which means the unconquerable sun, and the Jupiter... Dolichinus, they each had played a very, very key role with the previous rulers. The Persian cult of the ancient Iranian god of light, the Mithra, also had spread throughout the empire. So you got three different groups worshiping the sun throughout this world empire. Now they're developed, of course, what happens in any culture like this, everyone borrows from everybody else, you start melding these things. And they're, they're, they move toward a solar uh, monotheism to fuse these different elements into a single supreme god of all pagan divinities of the solar gods, Sol, Helios, Serapis, and Mithra. There's four of them, actually. This is the same kind of thing that Muhammad did in Arabia. The Koresh tribe had the franchise to manage the Kaaba, which was the scene of 360 idols. And uh, al Ilah. The moon god was, the lead, was, the, was one of these that Muhammad makes numero uno. And what Muhammad does is redesign this so it's, monothe it's still paganism, but it's monotheistic under the moon god. Al Ilah becomes Allah, and the moon, that moon god, the symbol, is on every mosque to this day. But all the paganistic, uh, pagan forms that preceded even the birth of Islam did not begin with Muhammad. He just repackaged it. But, but it's a very parallel situation in that regard. Now, there's another demographic factor you should understand. By the end of the imperial persecutions, which was about 313 A.D., the Christians were an illegal underground sect. They numbered about half the population of the Roman Empire. So embracing this underground sect is just shrewd politics. That's as just, this, just as shrewd as keeping our Boris porous for illegal immigrants as long as they vote Democratic. And I'm being a little cynical, but it's a practice. Ask anyone who lives in California, they know the problem. Now, Constantine, Emperor Constantine uh, served from 306 to 337 A.D. He did a lot of neat things. He abolished slavery. He abolished gladiatorial fights, the killing of unwelcome children. Now, there's progress. And he, he abolished crucifixion as a form of execution. He was so frustrated with the paganism that clung to the aristocracy of the major families in Rome that he relocated the capital of the world to Byzantium, renaming it like a new Rome, Constantinople. Now, by the way, this also may have been motivated by some very strategic insights and economic. Its proximity to the Danube and the Euphrates frontiers and the Straits of the Bosphorus 
and the Eastern commercial routes made it a shrewd move, fundamentally. It was a thousand years, uh, more than about 1,200 years later, that the, by then Islam, because they failed to keep the military up, got overrun by the Moors and it gets, becomes Istanbul and what have you. Now in 313 AD, the Edict of Toleration was issued by this Constantine granted to the Christians and all others full liberty in following that religion which each may choose. It was the first edict of its kind in history. Notice he didn't make it a state religion. He just made it legal to become a, If you want to be a Christian, you can do it legally. It was illegal up to then. He made it legal. It was his, the second successor after Constantine that goes even further and makes it a state religion. I'll come back to that. On March 7, 321, Constantine introduced the first civil legislation concerning Sunday. Now this is eight years later. He makes Sunday the official day of worship for anyone. That all judges and town people in the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. Does that sound Christian? He is unifying these four different sun god uh, myths or legends, whatever, with Christianity. You've got five different groups that will embrace the idea, okay, Sunday's okay, we can use Sunday. In 325, Constantine issued a general exhortation to all his subjects to embrace Christianity. Now this is 12 years later from the, from the Milvan Bridge episode. He ordered 50 Bibles to be prepared. Those are expensive in those days. They're all hand-done. Under the direction of Eusebius, the first vellum by skillful artists. Very key event in history. By the way, it was the fusing of, the, uh, of Christianity with the extant paganism that December 25th of Saul Invictus became Christmas of the Christians. Most of you do any study in the background here know that most of our traditions around Christmas are pagan transformations. And in his zeal to become the universe, to, for a universal creed, he presided over the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. He wasn't baptized personally until his deathbed on, in 327. So was he a Christian? I don't think so. There are people that defend that. There, there, scholars argue about it. I think he was just a very, very heads up sharp administrator. His later successor, Emperor Theodosius, uh, 347 to 395, who made Christianity the state religion of the empire. And uh, in legislation 380, he affirmed the dogmas of the Council of Nicaea and made church membership compulsory. Biggest disaster for the Christian church imaginable. Um, worst calamity ever befallen the church. He undertook the forcible suppression of all other religions, and in 392, he prohibited paganism. Doesn't that sound great? No. It means you're bringing it all under one, under one tent, huh? So that's begun, that begins the great apostasy where the church then occupies itself with the pursuit of temporal power. And you, to read, if you really want to understand the history of the church, you want to uh, read uh, Dave Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast, which is not only a history, but one of the few that really talks about it prophetically also. Uh, we, Dave and I did a briefing pack together called, if you want just a quick summary of it all, called The Kingdom of Blood, History of the Church. Now, if our perception of Revelation 13, 17, and 18 are correct, the current ecumenical movement that's, that's moving with great momentum throughout the world is going to ultimately lead to the same kind of ecclesiastical tyranny and the darkest ages of all. They don't call those dark ages for nothing when the church ruled. And uh, it's going to, they're going to try to do that again. Hegel was right. He's the Hegel, uh, George Willem Frederick Hegel said, History teaches that man learns nothing from history. And George Santayana expressed another way. He who doesn't know history is destined to repeat it. Let's get at the real issue and wrap this up. Many of us have encountered the zeal of Seventh-day Adventists or, or the like over the Seventh-day issue. And there are many of their observations I've incorporated in this overview. But by the way, it's not the Seventh-day issue that emerges as the theological relevant one. It's the issue of the role of the law and our liberty in Christ that's the fundamental issue. And interestingly, while there's a lot of fuzziness about Saturday and Sunday, there's no fuzziness of any competence on the issue of our liberty in Christ, because all of Paul's epistles, as a minimum, hammer that home. Epistles of Galatians, Colossians, Romans, far overshadow customs and traditions and, and so forth. I made a list of the specific assertions. I want to make sure I covered all those. I think I have in just the basic texts. But let me talk about the, the nail in the coffin for me. That's not quite, I didn't express that quite right. Let me, because that's usually when I put something down. What really surfaced the issue to me is the Bible prophecy. I had never taken the trouble to really tune myself to what happens to the Sabbath prophetically. 
Uh, remember now, the Sabbath was instituted as part of the creation, Genesis 2. It wasn't intrinsically linked to the law or the Mosaic Covenant, frankly. That, it happened to be included in the law, but that's not what its basis is. Turn to Isaiah 66. When I stumbled into Isaiah 66, I must have read it many times, but I never realized the implications of what it's saying in Isaiah chapter 66, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah, last few verses of it. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. Isaiah says, For as the new heavens and the new earth... When I say, I'll make a new heavens and a new earth, what book do you think I'm quoting from? You'd think Revelation, wouldn't you? No, we're quoting from Isaiah here. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. That's addressed to Israel. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another... And from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. What? This is millennial or beyond. This is, it shall, it shall come to pass that from one new, the months were always new moon to new moon. In the, that was another Jewish measure. From one new moon to the other. And from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. All flesh will come to worship the Lord when? On Shabbat. That's what it says. I, didn't, I never realized it before. Let me give you another example. Let's turn, turn to um, Ezekiel's temple. Let's turn to Ezekiel 44, verse 24. He's talking here, of course, about the millennial period, we believe. Verse 24, And in controversy they shall stand as judges, and they shall judge according to mine ordinances, and they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all mine assemblies, and they shall hallow my Sabbaths. This is millennial. They're the priests, the duties of priests are to support and sanctify the Shabbat. Turn over to Ezekiel 46. And we won't, in the interest of time, we won't read the whole thing, but you'll discover that um, verse, the whole chapter is on the subject. But thus saith the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut six working days, but on Shabbat it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The temple in the millennium is going to be closed except on Saturday. Now what that tells me is just a student of Bible prophecy. I'm not making a law thing about it. I'll come back to what the, I'm going to resolve this for you before we tie it off here. But it tells me that Shabbat is not displaced. If in the, if in the millennium, in, in the future, after the rapture, after whatever, if there's been a, some kind of permanent shift from, sun, from Saturday to Sunday, I think we see evidence of quite the kind of we see Saturday survive. Our God is Jewish is the point. Our venerating the first day of the week as the memorial of the resurrection is appropriate. And uh, there's no, there's no, I have no problem with that. Uh, its formal institution, I think, was attributed to, to ecclesiastic, you know, to, to secular history. Let's try to draw our conclusions here. The Sabbath was instituted for man at the creation. It was preceding to the law in the Decalogue. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath survives the church period. That startled me. Conformity to rules is not the basis of salvation. All law has been abrogated in Christ. He still reminds us that he that loves me will keep my commandments. So I'm not saying you shouldn't keep the commandments, but that's not your basis of standing before him. Sabbath is a time of devotion, not of rules. It is a benefit to take advantage of. And as a demonstration of God's love, he set aside the seventh day. Our God is Jewish. Remember the woman by the well? She said salvation is... Uh, uh, she asked him, because she was Samaritan. You know, is it Jerusalem, is it Gerizim? There was a, she had the issue, and he, he, he dismisses that first, but he answers her question before it's over. He says, salvation is of the Jews. All our benefits, every one of our benefits derived from the Abrahamic covenant. We're grafted into the true olive tree from the root of the Abrahamic covenant. We should not forget that we serve the king of the Jews. We're members of a church founded by Jewish leaders, and our highest authority is the Jewish Bible. While we are free of the law, we still are beneficiaries of the benefits of the creation and others. So... Now, in our culture, we don't really have a problem because we get two days off anyway. Really. So it's not, it's not some big doctrinal thing. The first day of worship is available to us in, as an opportunity. Most of us in our ministry should be ministering in some way on those days. 
And uh, the veneration of the first day of the week is a, is a memorial to the resurrection. That's appropriate. There's some arguments about its real significance in many ways, but seventh day of the Sabbath is still available as an opportunity. And uh, Romans 14.5 is our watchword there. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let everyone be fully persuaded in their own mind. Now the real question is, can you enjoy the benefits of Shabbat without coming under the law? And I personally believe that Adam, Cain, Enoch, Noah, Melchizedek all had instruction on the seventh day rest. Can't prove it, but I believe it for a lot of reasons. It was the pattern before Exodus 16, before the Ten Commandments were even given. I believe we can adopt, we do all the time, Jewish practices to our benefit. There's a number of men in this room that are circumcised that are not Jewish because it's healthier. And the women are, uh, the wives of those men are less susceptible to cervical cancer. In the uh, 20s or 30s, they discovered a phenomenal difference, the hygienic aspects of cervical So we, we adopt some of these practices to our benefit. There are some of the dietary laws that we still observe to our benefit, although obviously our, our culture uh, has a lot more freedom there too because of, of hygienic practices. So, but again, we're not trying to justify ourselves by works. We're just taking advantage of blessings God's given us by following His Word. So, one of the questions, because we're running over, so I should tie this off because they're going to run out of tape here pretty soon anyway, is uh, wh what am I doing? Huh? Nan and I, after studying this and so forth, tried to figure, where, where do we stand on this? So, on the one hand, you know, we, because of our peculiar lifestyle, because we're usually speaking at some church on Sunday, we, don't, we haven't started a local church here. But I can tell you candidly, if I was to start a local church, what reason we meet on Tuesdays here is because I don't want to conflict even with the midweek services of the church. We don't want to compete with the churches here. But it, it, that's our resolve. If we were, though, I'll tell you what I probably would do, and that way I would have our service on Friday night. Because of Shabbat, I might use that to, for some local color. I'd do it because that would leave the weekend free for the family. You know, I like that. I, I, I just, that, that's the way, I, that's just an expression. So what, Nan and I, how, what, what are Nan and I doing about this Saturday, Sunday thing? We're not under the law. Let me underscore that. I hope I've spent that enough time to make that really the thing. But what we do from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, Nan and I simply resolve to do three things. We have three rules. Whatever we're going to do, we decide to do deliberately. We take that time and do something de deliberately. Whatever we do with that time, we do together. And it can be a drive around the lake for the day. It can be a recreational thing. But what we resolve to do is set it aside for him, a time of prayer, a time of study, a time of rest from whatever other pressures that we're under. We have three rules. We do whatever we're going to do deliberately. The second rule is we do it together. The third rule is there are no other rules. <laughs> okay? It's not for justification. It's to avail ourselves of the blessing that God intended in the creation. We're not substituting that for Sunday. We, you know, of course, <laughs> to someone in the ministry, Sunday's a work day. But how many of you are in a, how many of you are in a full time ministry? Can I see a show of hands? Let me ask the question again. How many of you are saved? Ah, what have you done with it? Whether you know it or not, you're in the full time ministry. If you're in Christ, you're in the full time ministry. So I suggest Sunday may not be your day of rest. Sunday may be a day that you should be witnessing, supporting a pastor, doing something for the Lord. And so you can benefit even more by making Saturday a special day. Not a day of regulations, not combing Leviticus to find out what you can. No, 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 that's misplaced. But the main point, I also, as you can probably tell, I'm sorry if I'm, I don't, it's not my intention to offend any of the, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, that may be among us because they're very sincere, committed people. I just think that uh, they have some exciting discoveries to make in terms of God's grace and the freedom we have in Christ. And yet at the same time, many of us could benefit well by seeing their commitment and dedication to pleasing God. And, uh, and do a far more effective job at that than some of us who may be using our liberty as license.